I am giving, I am reading a, I'm basing it upon a text by Paul. But tonight I want to, again, we've read it, you know, variously. I've read it, and we've read it responsibly, and we've read it variously. Now, I want to read it from a trend you may never have heard of, and certainly most of you have never seen. It is a translation directly out of the Aramaic. But out of the Aramaic, the Eastern Church, the language Jesus spoke, and the language Paul spoke. I just read the same. It's uh, Philippians 3, 7 to 15. Not much difference, but a little, and by the King James, of course. But I thought you'd like to hear this. But these things, says Paul, which me, I counted a loss for the sake of Christ, and I still count them all lost, for the sake of the abundant knowledge of God, for whom I have lost everything. And I have considered all those things refuge, so that I may increase in Christ and be found in him, since I have no righteousness of my own law, but the righteousness which comes through the faith of Christ, that is, the righteousness which comes from God, through this righteousness I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and be a partaker of his even to a death like his, that I may by any means attain the resurrection from the dead. Not as though I had already attained or were already perfect, but I am striving that I may reach that for which Jesus Christ... My brother, I do not consider that I have reached the goal, but this one thing I do know, for get are behind me, I strive for those things which are before me. I press toward the goal to receive the prize of victory, highest calling through Jesus Christ. Then he gets a breath and says, Therefore, let the perfect just got through saying we weren't. Uh, let, therefore, let those of you who are perfect think. That's why we're meeting these Sunday nights. And if reason, if you reason any other way, said if you've got any other this, why God will be leaving this to you. Said I'm right about it, and if you don't see the way I do, I said God will show. Now, I've given you two mottos. I want to give you a third one tonight. You know that we're old, a 600-year-old book to help us along the way, called the Cloud, and we're basing our teaching on the New Testament, and then we're allowing this brother to help us a little along the way. And I gave you, have given you already, two mottos. They are, now forwards and let be backwards. You got that one. Last week I gave you a second one. He will that do but him alone. I give you the third one tonight. He is a jealous lover, and he suffereth no rival. Now, I have said that there are four identifiable stages uh, before. But there is a common Christian about which I have preached already. <coughs> And I'm still special Christian. I talked about that last week. Then we'll move on in the weeks to come into what we call a singular Christian. And then there is the Christian who has moved up into God until he has begun to be perfect, though it is said both by Paul and writer that we may begin in this life, uh, the life of perfection, but never attain fully to it till we attain it. Now, uh, Paul is our example, and Paul said in the text that I may know, and the word know there means acquaint or acquaintance, and it means experience. It means to be acquainted with and experience. You may be acquainted with a man, and yet not have experienced a man in any sense. To introduce you, for instance, to my friend, old, almost lifelong friend, Reverend Miller here tonight, uh, you could say, yes, I'm a queen, but you have not experienced him in the sense that I have, running around with him, traveling with him in his car, usually, and uh, preaching with him, with him here and there, and talking with him endless numbers of times and praying with him. There's a difference between acquaintance and experience. 
To get acquainted with God is one thing, but to go on to experience God in intensity and richness of acquaintance is something more. And Paul said, I want to know him in that depth and rich intensity. Because you see, as I have said many times, personality can't be fully known as one encounter. May may meet a person you don't particularly like at first. But after you get to know them, you get to liking them because the hidden uh, potentialities in their personality that you didn't know were there. Now, Christ is of increasing intimacy of acquaintance. And if I have anything to say to the church and to the alliance and to the evangelicals in the world, it is this, that our greatness is that we not only are not going on to know Christ in rich acquaintance, but we're not even talking about it. We don't even hear about it. It doesn't get into our mag, get into our books. It doesn't get onto our radios. It's not found in our churches. This yearning, this for him, in increasing measure. Now, we may enjoy this increase with that. I want you to hear me say that. And you say, but Jesus Christ is uh, he. Why do you call him that? Now, you may not understand me now, but as Paul says, if you think otherwise, even that unto you, before we can know God as a he, him, we know God as a that. I think that every theologian would agree with me on that. And I find back here in the book of words, First of all, before I read them, remember what was said to the Virgin, that holy thing which is born of thee shall become called the Son. That holy thing which is born of thee. And now, not an amateur theologian, <clears throat> but the man who had laid his head upon the breast of Jesus in his wondrous first epistle with the word that, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon in our hands and handled of the word of life. Personality is not found there. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, Father, and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's not in the last two lines of the third stanza that he put personality in there. It's that. Now, remember, my friends, that uh, Jesus Christ, while he is person, and you know that all agree that he's the person, he's the Son, the eternal Son, he is also that which is the source. He is that which is the foundation and the fountain of everything you and I are joy. He is the fountain of all truth, but he is more, he is truth itself. He is the source of beauty, but he is more, he is beauty itself. He is the fountain of all wisdom, but he is more, he is wisdom. In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden away. He is the fountain of all grace, he is the source of all life, but he is more than that. He said that I am the bread of life, and I am the life. He is love, but he is more than that, he is love. He is resurrection, and he is immortality. As the song says, brightness of the Father's glory, sunshine of the Father's face. You know, we cover what gets wrong with us when we start to backslide in groups and denominations and churches and individuals. And our Lord Jesus hit on the head of it when he said, Ye have left your first degree of love. 
not your consecutively in the sense that there's love number one and love number two and love number three, but he said you've left your first degree of love and what I'm preaching to try to bring about in the Church of Jesus Christ is a redis the loveliness of the Savior that we might begin to love him again with an intensity of love the fathers who knew. I have said before and I repeat it now that the power and greatness of A.B. Sim, his theology, for he positively was not a great theologian compared, for instance, with Calvin or some of the other theologians. The power of the man lay in his unquenchable love for the person of Jesus Christ the Lord. The song we sing, and I want to read two verses, there's two stanzas that we don't know about. The first one says, Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God and man the Son, thee will I cherish, thee will I sow the glory, joy, and crown. We know those, that one and two others, but there are others that we don't get. And it says, Fair are the flowers, fair are earth's children, when viewed in youth's unclouded day. They must perish, all will soon vanish. Jesus alone abides for us. Gaze out upon the family, your friends, your loved ones, all the little lovely beauty of children and young people view clouded day. Yet candor and realism compels, compel us to say they must perish, all will soon vanish. And when they have vanished, we have only who alone abides for a earth fairest beauty, heaven's brightest splendor, in Jesus Christ see all that here shineth quickly declineth before his spotless purity. There are those who trouble you because you can't be all, get all steamed up about things. Uh, a friend of mine was the uh, cause, uh, I, just, I just can't get all excited and steamed up about earthly things. I can't do it. I can't possibly stand off and uh, and strike an attitude of all oh, Adam Buick or a Cadillac or something else. I can't. And uh, the houses they're building that are supposed to be so awesome. Remember that when you have seen the house or the city that has foundations who build God, you can't get excited excited about any house ever any man in this world ever built. You can't get about it. Somebody said that Abraham saw the cities that had foundations whose builder and maker was God and built a house after that. He said, I'll never try to imitate it. I'll live in the tent till I get my house up there. It was so beautiful. Well, earth's in heaven's brightest splendor is all unfolded in Jesus Christ. And all that here she declineth before his spotless purity. That's what one man said about Jesus. Now I want to tell you that it costs Christ like that. It costs and most people won't pay the price for it at all. That's why most Christians are common ones because for Christ's sake they have surrendered to evil things. Uh, that is things that are injured and things that are unclean and grossly sinful. Everywhere in fundamentalism we have given up the grossly sinful. And we have all agreed on what those grossly sinful things are. We shudder at the thought of a haunt, though there are some churches and tabernacles that you couldn't tell the difference if somebody didn't yell Jesus occasionally to give it a holy atmosphere. The uh, honky-tonk, some unholy places, we stay out of them. And uh, there are certain things we don't, for Christ's sake, we have surrendered those evil things. But this is the mark of a common Christian who's never gone beyond that is a mediocre Christian. Paul surrendered the good along with the bad. And only the things that are bad have I given up. But he said, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost. The right to the things that were gained to him and that he had every legal and moral right to lay hold of and say, this is mine, not going to take it from me. 
He said, I've given up even that because I've seen something so much better. It is that which was with the source, that, 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 that fountain from which flows all wisdom and beauty and truth and immortality. For the sake of that, I have given it all up. He knew, Paul did, that the human heart was idolatrous to anything that it possesses. Anything that you get your hand on, you will worship. As a little child will take his teddy, so we grown-ups have our teddy bears, too. We were too grown-up and mature, you know, to be caught taking a teddy bear. But we have what must look to God like teddy bears and dolls. We hang on to them. The baby, of course, has a right to that. I believe teddy bears floating around for years at home until they got through them, and they were pretty old when they did. But uh, the point I'm making is that we oldsters, we, we mature people, people even in their teens, uh, we insist upon hanging on to things. Whatever you hang on to, you worship. Don't forget that, because it's been God. Whether it be property or family or reputation or security or self. And Jesus taught us that we couldn't even hang on to our life itself, that if we made our living on earth that we wouldn't give up and hung to, it would get in our way and we'd lose ourselves at last. He thought that plainly. And then this grasping after security, always. We want to be secure. Paul wasn't secure. He said he died daily. And he was out on the bosom of the sea for three weeks and I was always in difficulty. This, this longing for security. I want, I want security in this life. There's no security in the world above. And there we have it. That's fundamentalism. Security here and eternal security there. Well, give it all up. I disavow and disown everything. Now, there are certain things God let him have, a book or two, he let him have a garment, a cloak, he let him have uh, his own hired house for two years in one instance, and have some things, but Paul never allowed them to touch his heart. In the external treasure, your heart is a curse. And Paul said, I give that up, that I might know him, that I might go on to deep and increasing intimacy and vast expanses of knowledge of the one who is inimitable in his beauty, and I go on to know him, and that I might know him, I, but he never allowed anything to touch his heart. You see, friends, we have been taught over the last year in our Christian circles that Christ is something added on to a happy, jolly, really rather clean, but we like, to save us from hell and to get us into the mansions over there. But that's not New Testament way of looking at it. Paul looked at it at all. Paul looked at it as that Jesus Christ was so infinitely that he didn't count anything at all to amount to anything. Paul was a learned man. A learned at the feet of Gamaliel. He had what they'd call deep. Paul was a learned man. But Paul said, that's all dross. He said, he used an ugly word about it, uh, a garbage. Good, I put it all behind me. And he said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, and I'm circumcised the eighth day, and others, and I've got the marks upon me, and my name's in the register, and I can show you who I am. But he said, for the sake of I count that nothing at all. I put that under my feet. Some of you are proud of your Dutch blood, and that's why you're half colonel all the time. You're proud of your Swedish blood, and that's why you're colonel all the time. And some of you are proud of some other blood. All blood's the same kind of blood. And I don't care whether it comes from a royal ear, from the gutter, it's, or it's corrupt blood. But we're proud of it, proud of what we can do. Paul said, everything, the proudest thing I have, the thing of which I am the proudest, I count it but loss. Modern Christianity says, stop gambling or the bomb will get you. Stop drinking or you're home. Stop this or that. And you pick out those ugly, bestial things that nobody wants in their right mind. 
And that's all the sins there are. Paul said, I quit those so long ago. He never even did them. He didn't even do them. He was a Jew, and he didn't have to quit them. And that's why I sometimes uh, feel like kind of sourly when I hear a big testimony about somebody that drank and then he got saved and quit it. No, sure he did, but that ought to be elementary. That ought to be way back down the years. The man who writes a book on how bad... I have the book. I already have books I won't read. Well, friends, uh, now let's let this old a little bit here. He says, but one thing I tell thee, he, that is God, he's a jealous lover and he suffers no rival. Brethren, that's what's the matter with us. We're allowing rivals to come up. No, no, de no decent fellow body that has any, any uh, self-respect is going to suffer a rival, but uh, he says go rival. And he says here in this old English, which I'll translate into bad uh, modern English, he says, and work in thy will, but he only with thee by himself. He says that God won't work in your will, but only be there by himself. We have too many gods. We have too many irons in the fire, and we have too much don't understand, and we have too much religion, and too much churchanity, and too much institutionalism, and, and uh, much of too much, and the result is God isn't in there by himself. He says, if I'm not in your heart by myself, I will work. He says, remember that now, him list not work in thy will, but he only as he's there by himself. And when Jesus Christ has everything temple and dwells there alone, he'll work. An old Fenelon talked about him where he's a God's working like a miner in the depths of the earth. Have you ever been in the coal? Way deep down in the earth, they're mining out coal or gold or diamonds, and anybody can fly overhead or walk or travel by and never dream what's going on in the depths of the hill yonder. Never know that way in that hill unseen there is an intelligence bringing out jewels. And so said Fenelon that that's what God does in the human breast. Human and unseen within the breast. But we're dramatic in our day. We don't want God to work unless he comes with a beard and a staff uh, playing a part. We want him to be theatrical and, and, and uh, to do the thing, you know, a good deal uh, of color and pyrotechnics, which means fireworks and... Uh, in and we, God won't work like that. God says, no, no, no. You, you children of Adam, you children of carnality and lust, you show in the flesh, you, you who have been brought up wrong and have wrong ideas about my son, I won't work, I won't work in you. And Jesus said, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't work in you, in your will, nor is I can be there alone. What some of you need to do is cleanse the temple. You just need to get busy and throw out, drive out the money changers and shovel out the dirt and, and get rid of a lot of things that are rivaling the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the motto, he's a jealous lover and he suffereth no rival. And he goes on and he says this, lift up thine heart with a meek stirring of love and mean himself and none of these goods. And there too look thee loaf. I looked up in the unabridged, and it's an old Anglo Saxon word meaning um, unwilling, be unwilling. Uh, be unwilling to think on aught but God Himself, so that nothing works in your wit nor in your will. That's in your heart but only Himself. Now again, we're back to where we were started. When I said that Himself, when I said that Sage talked about Himself, and he shocked and blessed the generation because he talked about himself. He said, Jesus himself, it's himself. I suppose you know how himself came to be written. I'm sure somebody, if not, I told you about how Dr. Simpson went over to, to a Bible conference and there were three sermons on sanctification. And uh, he preached the last one. That's a bad spot to be in. The first fellow got up and said that the way to be holy and victorious in your heart was to suppress the old suppression. Another man got up and taught eradication. And he said deliverance from the old uh, carnal life, eradication, 
get rid of the old man, pull him up, turn him up to the roots, up to the sun, uh, to die. And I said between there, so he got up and he took one word for his text, himself. And he gave his testimony about how he had tried to pray. And he said, sometimes I would get it and think I had it and then I'd lose it. And then he said, when I came to the knowledge that vacation, deliverance, purity, holiness, all is himself. And he said, after that was easy to my life. I thought that was a beautiful piece of diplomacy. I also thought that it was a most wonderfully wise way to theology. And then around that he wrote his famous hymn, Once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once uh, his gift I wanted, now, the, uh, now himself alone. Now, uh, there's got to be more of himself these days. You know, Christianity, I've said this before, and I'm summing it up tonight, it has gotten to be a way of getting things, a, a way of, uh, we give a tithe in order that our nine-tenths will go further than our ten-cents. And I claim that any businessman who would ask with long, hairy ears, a man who would find out that by giving God one-tenth, his nine-tenths went in pad. Ordinary business would lead you to do that, wouldn't it? Sure it would. A man that wouldn't do that, that's not spirituality. That's... And if a man wants, if a man wants to be uh, a businessman and uh, use God, oh, I... but uh, that's, not, that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what Paul talked about. Paul had given up that years before. What the old writer of the cloud of unknowing talked about, he said, it's only himself. And he said, Now do thou that in thee is creatures that ever God made, so that thy thoughts nor thy desires be not directed nor stretched to any of them, but let no heed of them. So that uh, Christian businessmen are in danger. Now I, I talk to Christian businessmen. They, they want me to come and beg me to come just to say this to them. I'm not condemning my good friends of the Christian Businessmen Committee or my good and loved their magazine back here, Dave Enlow, but I say Christian businessmen can get to a spot where they make to be a way to have a prosperous business down here in a mansion in the sky. Either way you'll win. Follow the Lord, you'll prosper down here. Brethren, to follow the Lord doesn't always mean, in fact, I would thoroughly mean to have financial prosperity. But following the Lord has meant down the years to count loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And where a fellow prospers in spite of himself, by then the way he gets around it, he gives away, as much as he can at least, and keeps enough to live on. Thank God he's still here, body and soul held together, and a place to live, and the car to take him to... But further than that, he's not much concern. But we have made Christianity to be a way, a technique, by things. Paul didn't, he knew better than that. He said, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them, but dung that I may win, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection. Now it's himself. He said, let them be in them. That's why, that's why, somebody, that's why you can't get anywhere. And that's why some of you are going to stop coming to hear me preach this series, because we're getting around close where you weren't so near to you. But uh, we're beginning to stick the needle in a little, and you just don't want that. You'd like to have a gift that could be given to you with a syringe, or that could be given to you with a glass of water, and then and, and take one pill three times a day, and the fellow said, you just can't do that. But uh, some people, uh, uh, that, that's, that's the way they get their religion. They want it in pill form. And they buy books to get it in pill form. Is there any such a thing? There's a cross, there's a gallus, there's a man with stripes on his back, there's an apostle with no property, the tradition of loneliness and weariness and rejection and glory, but there are no pills. Some want the pill, but I say himself, himself, himself. Well, friends, wish, yet I don't wish, I don't wish anything. I pray for it, and if it isn't God's will, why, I don't want it, and if it is God's will, why? But I'd like 
to see somewhere, a recapture once more before I die of the glory that men knew of the beauty of Jesus. One old brother said this about him, his name is thou bearest, and I might say that as you students know, but the average person wouldn't have any reason to know, Ishai is the word for husband in the Hebrew. And so he wrote a poem about Jesus. This old brother, beauteous names thou bearest, brother, shepherd, friend, and king, but they none unto my spirit such support can bring. Ishai, Ishai is the jewel. Mine he is while ages roll. Angel such glory, holy Ishai of the soul. Other joys are short and fleeting, thou and I can. Thou art all together lovely, Ishai, Ishai of my heart. Let's, where could you sing that now? Well, I think we could sing it here, though. But there aren't many places where you can sing it because people don't have the experience that it embodies. Whenever a song is rejected, it's rejected as a rule it's a good song because the people find it and they find it dull. If you like rock and roll, you won't like Ishai. And if you like lazy watches over me, you won't like Ishai. And if you like tea, you won't like Ishai. Ishai, oh, mine he is while ages roll. Angel, taste not of such glory, holy Ishai of the soul. And this is the pure light. It is to put away all the creatures that ever God made. And stop trying to promote your family, promote your business, and use God to do it. Stop trying to promote anything and use God to do it. And put everything away with God. Work in my heart, unless you can be there alone. Put everything else out. Some young preacher will study until he has to take care of his failing eyesight. Because he has an idea he wants to become a famous preacher. And he wants to use Jesus Christ to make it. He's just a huckster buying and selling and getting gain. They'll ordain him and he'll be known as Reverend. And if he writes a book, they'll... And uh, he'll be known as Doctor, but he's still a huckster buying and selling and getting gain. And if the Lord comes back, he'll sample along with the other cattle. But uh, we can use the Lord for anything. Or try to use him. But you and what Paul taught here and what was picked up by the centuries and brought down the years, and what gave birth society that you and I know about and belong to was just exactly the other thing. Oh, God, we don't have, we want thee. That's the cry of the soul on its way up. That's the cry of the soul. In England, they say, there's a bird called a skylark. We don't have them here. The nearest thing we have to it here that does the same thing is the, what they say, the American goldfinch. But it's a poor little weak example of the skylark. So they say the skylark will mount as soon as it mounts. And the poets have talked about it. They have said that the skylark mounts in the heaven gate. And it mounts until it's out of sight, they say. And they can still hear the song coming down while they can no longer mounting and singing as it rises. My friends, this is what I'm preaching about, but this is what most people don't. I think most of you must or you wouldn't be here because you knew what I was going to preach on. Another thing a man said that I've always loved to quote, love sits on his eyelids and scatters delight to all the wide regions above. Cherubim veil in his sight and tremble with raptures of love. And these people who have to have clothes of gadgets to get their religion going, what will they do when they don't have anything like that? They're, that's where they're going. I heard a man boast this afternoon on the radio to come to his place because they were going to bring in equipment from Pennsylvania to, to serve the Lord with. Equipment? What equipment do you need to serve the Lord with, brother? So I, as a dear old camp meeting lady used to see this is my heart of harp of ten strings. He said, this is my harp with ten strings, and I praise the Lord in the old round spots, you know, on them. And they clap their little old wrinkled hands with shining faces. The harp is, what do you need? What do you need? Do you need a bushel back, a basket full of guff? 
uh, to serve the Lord with, brother, if you have two knees. And even if you're stiffened up with arthritis so you can't get on your knees, you can look up in your heart for prayer isn't getting on your knees. Elevation of the heart to God. That's all a man needs. You can pray in a prison. You can pray on an airplane, and I do, and you can pray in a ship anywhere, and you can worship God because himself, it's himself that we want. Himself lives and scatters delight to all the wide regions above, and their faces, the cherubims, veil in his sight and tremble with raptures. Of now, the only kind of revival that I'm even remotely interested in is the kind of revival that will cause people to tremble with the of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. Now, I'm nearly through. But I'd like to say this to you. The Proverbs, um, devotionally every day, and I've gotten into the 13th chapter, and I rather smiled when I read one of the Proverbs that runs in, in, in uh, King James, but I have it in two other translations here. Uh, one of them says, Ed is employed in wishing. That's the Septuagint verse. The old Greek version translated in English. Every sluggard is employed. And the Knox translation says, Idleness will and will not both at once. Now there we have a lot of Christians. They're sluggards. And being a, a, a lifelong student, I wouldn't take that word at its face value. I said, what's a sluggard? So I looked up, it up to find out what a sluggard was. Well, a slug is a streamlined snail. And uh, when they crawl along, they, they do about, uh, about a, mile, a millennium. They just crawl along, leaving a wet streak behind them. That's a slug. And uh, a lay slug, some fellow looked at it, and then when his son wouldn't work, he said, you're like that slug, you're slugging. And that's how we got the word in slugging. And uh, the Bible says that uh, every sluggard is employed in wishing. Uh, chases from one part of the city to the other to hear a new evangelist, uh, hoping that he can become a spiritual man, but he's too old. He will and he will not, both at the same time, he says. Now, that, that's the way Christ, a lot of Christians are. And what are you going to do? With, do I have to wake him up? I can't. I've set up every alarm clock I could wind up and print and, and public, and I'd get up. Sluggards will be sluggards till the Lord comes, I suppose. But I think some of you here wings and get rid of the shell. I'll tell you this. But if some of you went to keep your soul, you'd be in for a divorce, your wife, your husband wouldn't stay around. And if some of you men, isn't it the way you keep your soul, your wife couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't live because you, you'd go bankrupt. What's your response? Well, in closing your seven minutes, the old brother says this, and I found it true. I'll, uh, I'll paraphrase him and then read. He says, uh, if you're going to go on now, know God, get up and stir yourself and lift and put away things and desire for property and things and seek himself alone and let him work in you without any... Well, he says, all the things will be sure can now do it this. And they will try to do all that they can do. You won't get it to the corner with what some things will be after you. So if you want security, don't seek God. The devil will give it to you for a while and send you to hell. If you're afraid of kings and all the rest, don't try to seek God. This and I like it. He says, let not, therefore, but travail therein till thou see lit. Now I'll explain that. I don't want to be boring. That means don't, don't be hindered. Don't let anybody hinder you in your seeking after God, but travail therein until you see it. They were all such practical men, these old saints. They claimed they were dreamers. They weren't dreamers. They were practical men. He said, get out to seek a new height, to become something other than a common Christian. He said, the first thing you'll find, the devil facing you to stop you. And he said, I'd stop because of that, but press right on whether you feel like it or not. And there are two times to pray when you don't. And some want to be emotionally lifted and wafted into the sky, but the old saints knew better than that. Now then, when you've got to, by what he calls a naked intent unto God, 
I want you to take that. A naked empty sense. Now that's what we need, brethren, is this naked intent to know God, to know Christ, to put the world beneath our feet, beneath our feet, to put people beneath our feet, to, to open our hearts to only one lover, and that's the Son of God himself, and keep everything else out of it. Have all the relationships, husband and wife, father and son, mother and daughter, businessman, taxpayer and citizen, all those we keep outside of ourselves. But in the deep of our heart, one love, and he, he suffers no right. But in the deep of our heart, we have only one love, and he, he heal Now, why does God make us do it this way? He says it's to the intent that your understanding and your reason and your whole faith be thrown back on God. And from there on, we mount and go. I said I don't think anybody was ever filled with the Holy Ghost who didn't go through a time of awful darkness. And what he called the cloud of unknown, the shadowy cloud where you couldn't seem to get through. But you believed God and you trusted Christ. And whether or not you went on, and you believed and you obeyed and you prayed when you felt like it and you prayed when you didn't. And you obeyed, and you did what you should, straighten things out, and you got adjusted in your business, and you got adjusted in your home, and you got adjusted in your relationship, and you quit wrong things, but things that have been hindering you, whether you felt like it or not. He says it's all a naked intent under God. Here's the strangest thing. If you talk about mysticism in the day in which we live, every fundamentalist throws his hands high in the air as though the, the spirit of... Uh, of uh, old Stalin. And they say, well, they're dreamers, they can in feeling. Every one of them that I'm acquainted with taught you've got to believe God by a naked, cold intent of your will. And then the other things follow along. Most unusual thing. I got a letter this week from the this trick, asking me to write a review of the book on mysticism. If you can get mixed up any worse than that, I don't know how. But that is, they want me to review a book on mysticism that had been written by Dean Eames years ago. Mysticism, is it possible that we find cold, square doctrine, theology are not enough? Is it possible everywhere I'm speaking something better? Yes. All together possible, more than possible. Thou feelest in thy will only a naked intent unto God. Have you got that tonight? A naked intent unto God. This brings you're going to be that kind of Christian. And you're not going to let anybody stop in or fool you. And you're going to keep right on, and if you don't feel like it, you're going to believe anyway, and you're going to pray right on through with a cold, naked intent unto God believing the truth. Oh, I have this to tell you. God will out of your stony grief, he'll raise a bell. Out of he'll lift you into the sky. Out of the darkness, he'll lift you into the light. Old oh, Moody went down to here and lay on his little tummy on the floor in the kitchen on the sent home and prayed that he might be baptized with the Holy Ghost for God nowhere. And then went out from there to the city in the east. Blessed Holy Ghost fell on him. He cried, Oh, God, stay thy hand or I'll die. Up out of his stony grief, God, it's always so. But the chief saintly and the undersized, they won't be happy unless they can be happy. They just won't. They just demand it. I wouldn't put it past some of our so-called evangelical leaders to send the person feathers to tickle the chins of them happy, to make them laugh. They'll do anything in the world to make people temporarily tickle Jesus and himself. But if we get himself, we'll get all the joy and delight and all the rest. I'm a hard man in some ways, but there are times when the joy of the Lord it's my heart very, very high.
The times when I sit down here looking as if I was dead, I suppose, they say I do. Colorless and the more unemotional heart there, there, oh, there's such a joyous look toward God that I could clean up my joy. What about it? Day 30 and I'm going to quit. Do you want what I'm talking about? I want to move on past the low level of the common Christian and go on to know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship and the excellency of his knowledge. An increasing flight to spiritual elevation. You do. I've taken you a little further, and I think you do, or you wouldn't be here. Now, let us pray. Now, before I pray, I want again tonight to know who wants me to pray. Uh, you're a little puzzled. Or even a little upset. The neat step-by-step -step tucked up uh, formula that you have uh, been traveling on is sort of bothered tonight by this kind of preaching, and you'll want to come back, whether I'm a little off my beam or just far. But in your heart is one thing you can recognize, and that is a cry, Oh, God, I want thy stuff. I want thy stuff. I will isha, isha. I want to know a husband in my heart. I want to know what the old prophet and what the holy God shall call me no more, Lord, I shall call me Ishai, for I will be a husband unto you. You want to know the eternal husband, the, the spiritual bridegroom of your heart. That you do know. You don't, you're not so sure about all the doctrines, but this one is after, oh my God, that's what I want. And I want to pray for you. And if I pray for you now, remember this. I'm going to be as rough as he has to be. And it'll be as hard on you as he needs to be. That he might bring you through out of this past in which Christianity is wallowing now. Up the sunlit highland. And it may be tough on you. To go back and write a letter home and straighten out things. Maybe some of you'll have to pay up where you didn't pay. Maybe some of you'll have to quit you've been very close to you. But anyway, we're going to put everything under your feet and say all the told you that I may know him and I don't care what it costs. Pray for him. Who raise your hand? And you, you, who else? Put the hand up, yes, I see you. And you. Put the hand up. Yes, sir, I see your hand right there. And you, sir. Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know it's we live in a world where perils and dangers are on every hand, and life and time is speeding, and judgment is coming, and Satan is busy, Bones are squaring themselves across the path, trying to prevent us from going ahead. But we hear thee come to us, and we want to know thee, and the power of thy resurrection suffering and be made conformable unto thy death. And we want to know the beauty and wonder that it is. And we pray for these who request it, prayer, O oh, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus. Thou who did come in olden times in the form of a dove and from a fire, and thou who did come to Peter and to the Moravians and to the saints of New England, thou who did come, O Lord, in spots here and there, just oh, withhold not thy glory from us. We cry, show us thy glory, Lord, show us thy glory, and teach us how to go on. Now grant, we pray, that this may be a good week, and if the devil makes it the worst week we've ever had, we'll have a naked intent and determination, and we'll calmly, quietly believe, even though we should, even though 
the, the darkness should settle over us, we'll know it's the cloud of unknowing. It's the dark night of the soul that preached morning of the heart. And we won't be frightened. Do we know thou didst go through the garden and through the cross and out of the darkness and into the tomb and out of the tomb and into the glory? So wilt thou lead thee and lead us and lead this church. And oh, we pray, bring us to a place where soon we may be under grace, spiritually prepared for a mighty outpouring of the Holy An outpouring that shall bring in reality that which everybody's talking about and nobody has. And we shall testament spirituality back to Book of Acts, Christianity again. Maybe out from us here there shall flow into the desert way and fire that shall cut churches and groups as we wait. And above all things, show us thyself, thyself, Lord, and show us thy glory. As thou passest by, and show us thy glory so that all the glory of this world shall appear as ash that wondrous sight. This we ask in the holy name of Jesus. Now as we close the ray, the scene as a little soul of us, opening verse or two or stanza or two of that, what is it? Yes. And we join in singing the